Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It will cost over $53 billion this year, more than one-third the New York State budget. It will cost $10 billion more in four years. It is a massive program with increasing gravitational pull on the state budget. 4.5 million New Yorkers, nearly a quarter of the population of the state, partake of it. It is the third rail of New York State politics. It's Medicaid, and here to discuss the problems and prospects confronting Medicaid is New York Lieutenant Governor Richard Ravitch, who on September 20th communicated to Governor Patterson a report controlling increases in the cost of New York Medicaid. Mr. Ravitch has a distinguished history of public service. He rescued the Urban Development Corporation in the 1970s, is widely credited with saving the MTA as chairman from 1979 to 1983. He also chaired the 1987-88 Charter Revision Commission. He has also served as Major League Baseball labor negotiator, and in July 2009, he was sworn in as lieutenant governor. Joining me and Lieutenant Governor Ravage today and next week is my friend and colleague at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, Sarah Bartlett. Sarah is the director of the Urban Reporting Program at the school, and prior to that, she held the Bloomberg chair at CUNY's Baruch College, following a distinguished career as writer and editor on business and economic issues for Business Week, Fortune, and the New York Times. Along with hundreds of articles, she has written two books, Schools of Ground Zero and The Money Machine, How KKR Manufactured Power and Profits. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome, Lieutenant Governor Ravitch. The last time you were here, you were Mr. Ravitch, and it was December 2008, and we talked about the MTA. Lots happened since then. Belated congratulations, belated condolences, which one? I, I don't think you have to characterize the condition which I've sat for the last uh, year. Okay. You're known as Mr. Fix-It. Uh, the Times Union in its headline says, Mr. Ravitch's call to action. They call you, but they don't listen. Why? What is it about New York state government that they bring you in, and what comes of it? I, I can't uh, comment on that uh, too objectively. Obviously, I think that um, there are a number of people in elected positions who have been very supportive of some of the ideas I've put forth. Uh, it isn't the lack of adoption of my recommendations that bothers me as much as the lack of serious public discourse. Mm -hmm. There is almost none of that in Albany. Um, part of that is a function of the way the government works, and part of it is a function of the people who hold the offices at any given point in time. But <clears throat> I think that the proposal I made last March in connection with the uh, state's budget I thought deserved discussion. I could recognize and respect the fact that people might not agree with parts of it, but there was never a debate on the floor of either body, and uh, obviously I shared it with the governor first, and he chose not to support it, And uh, but I never really had a full discussion with him either about it. Ooh, frustrating? Very. Medicaid, you, part of your charge has been to look at the fiscal condition of the, of, the, of the state, and you recently, I guess on September 20th, delivered to the governor a report on Medicaid and Medicaid savings. What are we talking about here? What is Medicaid? Well, Medicaid <clears throat> is a program financed by the states and the federal government to provide health care for the poorer people in this society. Uh, Medicaid was appended to the Medicare legislation that uh, President Johnson submitted to the Congress in 1965. President Johnson was terribly, terribly concerned about the fact that 
the elderly people in this society had the greatest uh, health care problems, obviously, by definition, and that they couldn't afford it, particularly as, <clears throat> as science was perfecting medicine's ability to cure disease, uh, thus adding to longevity. So he proposed Medicare. Medicaid got appended to it, uh, ironically viewed or intended to be uh, an adjunct to the poverty program. <clears throat> and Medicaid was, for 30 odd years, administered in most states by the agencies that administered welfare. Uh, so the Department of Government that gave out the welfare checks or um, aid to dependent children, support, that kind of thing, were the ones who provided Medicaid. Now Medicaid has become close to being a middle class entitlement. One, of One out of four people in New York State are, are on Medicaid. That's a, shocking, that's a shocking number. Now how will that be changed by the Obama health care reform? Oh, it will increase eligibility, it won't diminish it. Why? Well, you have to understand both sides of, of the issue. On one side of the issue, uh, of course, is the fact that um, we're a, we certainly were, but we still are somewhat of a rich nation, and a lot of people believe that in a country like ours, everybody ought to be, have access to decent health care. And the fact that 35 million people in the United States without any form of health insurance whatsoever uh, is a pretty d damning commentary uh, on our society. So uh, is the financial on burden? On the other side of it is the, the financial burden is enormous. And the Medicaid program was designed um, to provide uh, that the federal government pick up a percentage of the cost, but the decisions of eligibility and the scope of the Medicaid programs were decided state by state. And the federal government had a formula that determined how big a percentage the feds picked up. And unfortunately, that formula was very prejudicial uh, to New York. Matter of fact, I remember very vividly in about 1991, Pat Moynihan tried very, very hard to get that formula changed. And the reason that New York is adversely treated by that formula is because it is in, intended to be a determination based on how many people are in poverty. What is the average um, uh, per capita income? And how does that compare to the poverty level? But in New York, uh, we have a lot of rich people, but, but a lot more poor people. So the, the number washes that, out. The, therefore, the average is higher. So Mississippi, for example, gets 50% higher a percentage of federal pickup of their Medicaid expenses than New York. And that's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> Well, we're talking about a huge amount of dollars in 2010. It's $53 billion That's out of, a, what, a $130 billion budget? So yes. it's more than a third of the budget. And, and you've said that, quote, that the program is increasing its gravitational pull on the state budget. Yes. Your, the, the thrust of this is if you don't fix Medicaid, you can't begin to fix the structural problems in the state budget. That you got it. That's exactly what I said. Do you think there'll be any greater political resolve going forward since you've published the report? Do you feel like that resonated with anyone? Well, first of all, uh, I don't want to be too judgmental. We're in the middle of an election year and, and uh, politics. Uh, but this is gravitational. It's, it's yes. not, it's well, divorced I'm, I'm from politics. I'm coming. I don't expect... Um, a serious public discussion now. I, I was very pleased that a number of newspapers in the state thought it was worth reporting, mm -hmm. and actually a number of prominent newspapers gave it editorial support. And I don't really expect the people who are running for office to stop their campaigning and, and go into uh, serious public discussion. So my hope is that after election, the, and, um, the people who are elected uh, 
will know who runs the Senate, that they'll pay attention to, to this and uh, hopefully people have better ideas or additional ideas, uh, but they can't ignore the numbers. Have you discussed this at all with the legislative leaders or with uh, candidates for governor, uh, putatively, the governor-elect uh, Andrew Cuomo? I have not. Uh, I would be glad to, but um, Mr. Cuomo was very busy running and he hasn't chosen to speak to me. What would some of the economic impacts be yeah. of cutting the kind of uh, numbers out of Medicare and Medicaid <clears throat> that you're talking about? I mean, won't that throw a lot of people out of work? And are, are New Yorkers really ready for a reduced level of service? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I was very careful not to suggest a reduction in eligibility. A lot of people, uh, you read publication of the Manhattan Institute, they say re reduce uh, the number of people who are eligible. Uh, I, I'm not sure that, speaking for me very personally, uh, that I don't think that's um, something that has to be thought through very, very carefully. What I do say is that there is enormous amount of waste, duplication, inadequate management in the administration of this program. Primarily home care, long-term care, nursing home care, uh, where for a combination of complicated reasons, including inattention, uh, uh, we, we fund things that no other state funds. Uh, <laughs> now, I can't say they're bad things, but if my Aunt Tilly was, uh, had to go to a nursing home after she had surgery, and Medicare paid for her surgery, uh, she would have to apply to Medicaid uh, to get reimbursed for nursing home care. And that would go through a local government, uh, and if Aunt Tilly was well-connected politically, she'd probably get uh, a high level of reimbursement. Uh, and if she wasn't, she might not fare so well. Uh, uh, we need to move heavily to get into more managed care programs. We have two great Medicaid managed care companies in this, in this um, city, Health First and Fidelis, in the state, I should say. Uh, and they like any HMO. Um, because they can spread the risk amongst a large number of people, they can reduce health care costs uh, very, very significantly. And then, so we have to take that plus, I mean, there are a lot of very specific things, including taking, um, taking the responsibility and ultimately the cost away from the local governments. So you, one of the things that the, uh, the report suggests is that one of the problems is, as you just said, administrative decentralization and that this variation produces inefficiencies. Technically, the, the response is centralized, but politically, let's talk about the politics of this. These are extraordinarily, as you know, well entrenched interests. Is this, is this likely to occur politically, even though rationally, well, from an administrative point of view? Well, let me say, as I... Uh, observed as a citizen and, and studied, there is no question that during the last 20 years that the union that represents most of the healthcare workers has had an enormous amount of influence on politics. And it's healthcare uh, providers too. I mean, the Greater well, Hospital you, Association, absolute, et cetera. Absolutely correct. But their, their political influence was exercised largely because of the, the number of uh, people who uh, work for 1199, if we want to tell the truth. <laughs> and, and they're not bad people. Uh, the guy who ran it all those years, a genius, wonderful man. I respect him enormously, Dennis Rivera. But they had a tremendous amount of influence. So that, for example, when Blue Cross Blue Shield went private and the state extracted a sum of money out of the initial stock offering, uh, that was spent immediately uh, on health care, thus raising the level of expenditure when there was no substitute revenue uh, to continue. So what's the, the countervailing force to that? How do you fight right. that? Well, I think that is true in a whole series of areas. I don't fault pe people for having used the political process to get 
what they want. You read every day about um, um, David Brooks had a column uh, saying, look at the benefits public employees get, isn't it outrageous? Um, and we can't afford a, a new tunnel. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to say it's outrageous. It's another thing to mean by that there was something wrong or improper about that. They exercised their, their political power. The question is, why didn't anybody exercise it in the opposite direction? Right. And the answer is that the chattering class has been asleep at the switch. The answer is the media doesn't educate people about these public policy issues. It, the answer is the business community cares about their own individual business interests, uh, uh, but they don't take an active interest in budget matters. I would respectfully suggest that the fact that there were more column inches devoted to Senator Montserrat's uh, troubles with the law uh, than they were to the entire state budget last year is um, a commentary uh, on what's, in my view, wrong with this society and why there aren't more people who are saying, hey, let's, let's expose, let's have more transparency in government and let's make these decisions a lot more openly. One of your proposals here is to change the reimbursement, the way, it, the way it occurs, and not set by statute, but by independent commission. The legislature is going to give up that power? I would hope they would. Uh, what, uh, excuse me, let's talk likelihoods here, between <laughs> zero and 100. I'm, is, is it more than zero? Well, I think if the thoughtful people in the society were to recognize that we're almost the only state where the rates are set by an elected legislature instead of by, I didn't say they should be set by an independent commission, so we should have an independent commission like they have under Medicare to make recommendations, but they should be set by the Department of Health, by the person in charge of Medicaid. Now, I don't think anybody who holds a government position can uh, ignore the legislature uh, they still have the ultimate power of appropriation, as indeed they should, and their views ought to be listened to. But they ought not to get into the level of, of detail and setting rates the way they do now as part of the budget process. What, what's an example of something that New York State does that other states don't do? Well, I just said I'm not aware of any other state where the legislature No, but I mean in terms of, of benefits the, that are given to residents or things that we pay for that, that others don't. Well, I, I think we pay for a level of home care that uh, is not replicated in most other states. I, I can tell you, for example, in California, which has twice the population that we have, they have half the Medicaid expenditures that we have. So you know that there are a lot of things we're doing that they're not. doesn't mean it's right, um, but <clears throat> as the state loses economic or falls behind in economic growth and a higher and higher percentage of our population are poor people, we have a big responsibility to figure out what we can afford and how do we spend it. Is the long-term goal or, or should the long-term goal be a, a state takeover of Medicaid and removing the local share of the... Uh... Yes. Yes, absolutely. Is of there course, an the county execs it? want to keep the administrative power, but they want the state to pay for it. But they can't have it both ways, and they know that realistically. Is that, again, looking at likelihoods? You know, uh, Doug, it, we're, we're, we're in a different universe now because of the fiscal problems that New York State and other states face. Uh, and it, it is a totally different paradigm. And all, what I've tried to do is to get people to at least acknowledge it and talk about it. But, it, but, but they're going to have to. But excuse me, they still believe in the flat earth. How do you convince them that the earth is round and not well, the center I, of the universe? I, it's not me. Running out of cash is a hell of a teacher. Okay. So you think that just the severity of the economic situation and yeah. potential collapse will bring everybody to their senses? Or at least yes. to the table. Or at least to the table? To the table. Mm -hmm. You're optimistic? 
Well, I think what you're saying is you it's know, inevitable. I, it's fiscally inevitable. Yes, I do. Now, the question is, what kind of leadership will there be managing that process? Will there be a fair and equal result? If you think about it, look at all of the people who have a stake in the fiscal thing. It's public employees, current, and retired because there's serious efforts to re-examine pension sure. obligations uh, and health care obligations. The present value of the contracted for health care obligations of the state of New York, totally unfunded, is $52 billion. Uh, so that's one group that has to re-examine where they are, and the current and former public employees, debt holders. Uh, they have to uh, be part of a process. Uh, so do all of the uh, recipients of public services. Um, Wait a second. This sounds a lot like the 1976 New York City fiscal crisis situation and the response, which you were part of uh, under Governor Carey. How similar is the fiscal crisis that we face today, the economic crisis more than fiscal, and the fiscal crisis of 76? Well, I think in most respects, this is far worse. Uh, New York City had a problem because it had been borrowing money that it didn't have the real resources to repay in a period of a recession. And consequently, the banks got concerned and decided they would no longer underwrite the notes and bonds of the city. And it turned out when all of that was publicly put on the table because the possibility of bankruptcy was so scary to every responsible citizen and every responsible elected official, Republicans and Democrats alike, that we had to find an alternative. Is that the parallel now that's well, so bad I, that you got to do something? Well, the problem today is far more serious in that the long-term fiscal situation is getting worse. What we did in New York City was, first of all, because we had the power to, to uh, file a bankruptcy petition, which you don't have with states. States can't go into bankruptcy constitutionally. Uh, you had the leverage to get the unions and the banks to do things that they would never consider doing. But isn't another deficiency or difference between then and now that there was active state leadership under Governor Carey, who took the reins, put together this team of rivals. Do we have that? Do you, do you, is the leadership there now? Is well, there perspective I, I, leadership? And well, also in the no. business community is there leadership. I mean, there, was, there were people within right. the private sector who rose to the occasion. And do you feel the same, you know? Well, all I can tell you is, uh, as every year has gone by, Hugh Carey is taller and taller and taller, <laughs> in my judgment, number one. Number two, uh, he had the uncanny ability. I mean, he was a marvelous politician, but he also had a grasp of business and economics. And he pulled people around him uh, that he never knew before. I had never met him in my life. As a matter of fact, I had refused to send him a contribution when he ran for governor well, in 1974. Play, you, play, you played golf with Howard Samuels? I played tennis. Ran? Oh, tennis. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, he was a, he is uh, a man of such extraordinary uh, uh, integrity and and, um, and skill, not to be believed. But then no um, no carries on the horizon. Well, I'm not going to comment. I hope that uh, Governor Cuomo will rise to the to the task. He's bright and he's honest, and he has a lot of political. Uh, blood in him, and he has, therefore, the ingredients to be a great governor, and I hope he will be, because we need it. Remember one important thing, and that is that, that we have a system of government that is um, very focused on the power of a governor. You cannot expect any other—I mean, 
I have enormous respect for the legislature. It makes me kind of countercultural. Uh, <laughs> I don't agree with anybody, uh, almost everybody who writes about it, who treats them as if they're a bunch of thugs. Uh, I have enormous respect for the process uh, and for the majority of people in it. Uh, but the initiative has got to be an executive initiative. And that requires not just a first class governor, it requires good people in government. Uh, and it and requires recruiting talent is part of the challenge. Uh, doesn't it also require good people in the in the public sector labor unions to come and sit at the table? And do you see the kind of leadership there that well, you need? Well, I, I, uh, yes, I, I happen to uh, I, I happen to think that somebody like Mike Mulgrew is a terrific leader, understands the world's changed. Uh, I don't expect these people to be talking the same talk I, I engage in, but in my, it's not their job. But in private discussions with them and their counterparts in Washington, they, they have a very honest understanding of the fact that their world's got to change. You said before, what about business leadership? There isn't, unfortunately, the kind of civic leadership that there was back in the 70s. Uh, and that's due to many things. The banks did, don't have the same stake. Um, other than their desire to underwrite the securities of New York. Uh, because they become globalized. They have, they've local. become globalized, that's yeah. exactly right. And, um, you know, a, a culture changes too. I, I think uh, there were more people in, in my youth who were dedicated to giving part of their life to public service and, and spending time Yeah, you don't have much competition. Things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's a serious problem also. My thanks to you, Lieutenant Governor, and to you, Sarah. We will continue this discussion. We'll look into the future. We'll look into the past. Thanks. My pleasure. Fun to be here. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. <laughs>